The Peter Schiff Show. Well, the British actually voted to leave the EU, and it wasn't even that close. I think by midnight last night, it was pretty obvious that the leave was going to beat the remain. In fact, I think it ended up at 52 percent voting to Brexit and 48 voting to remain part of the EU. Now, of course, the markets were taken completely by surprise. In fact, we had rallies into the close on Thursday as everybody was so confident that the polls would be right and the online casinos would be right and that it was pretty much a sure thing that the British were going to vote to remain. After all, all of the experts, all of the economists and the political elite and everybody uh, all around the world, including President Obama, had lectured the British as to why the smart thing is to stay in the EU and how dangerous it would be, how awful it would be, how it would be like the second coming of uh, the Antichrist, uh, economic Armageddon, if... um, they voted to they voted to leave. And of course, you know, maybe this was a little bit of a reverse psychology. Maybe had they urged the Brits to vote uh, to leave, they would have gone remain. I mean, sometimes you want to just do the opposite of what you're being encouraged to do, especially when you've been lied to so many times and you've been sold so many bills of goods over and over again. You know, when the same people tell you, trust us, we know what's right for you and you need to stay in the EU because a lot of people in Britain were made a lot of empty promises and a lot of people over there are experiencing the same type of problems that we're experiencing on this side of the pond. They have a falling standard of living. They have a rising cost of living and people are getting more and more desperate. And here we're reaching for straws like um, Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders And the straw that they had was Brexit, leaving the EU, and that is what they voted to do. Now, I think the markets, of course, are way overreacting to what the implications are uh, for Europe exiting uh, the EU. After all, think about all the countries that aren't in the EU, right? I mean, so, I mean, if it's so terrible to not be in the EU, why aren't we all members, right? I mean, why doesn't the United States join? I mean, look, they can't even get Switzerland to join the EU, and it's right there smack in the middle of Europe. In fact, you know, one of the reasons that Switzerland is probably the most prosperous country in Europe is because it had the good sense not uh, to get into the EU and not to adopt the euro as its currency, although it's de facto kind of adopted it through intervention. But I think what happened is the markets believe their own hype. I mean, for so long, we were talking about how awful it would be if the British actually voted to leave, that when they did vote to leave, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because look, everybody is a short-term trader, right? They're all in this for the quick trade. A lot of these guys are all levered up. And so the minute this event happened, everybody hit the same sell button, right? Everybody had the risk on trade, right? The risk on things are good. Uh, we're not going to Brexit. So it was a false alarm. Buy stocks. You'll make money. People borrowed money. They levered up. They, they got long. Everybody was prepared for a remain vote to carry the day. And instead, we got uh, the leave vote. And so everybody had to hit the sell button at the same time. That's really what happened. It's not that this is such a bad event economically that everything is collapsing. All this is reflecting is traders having to reverse their their bets. I mean, if you look at what happened in the flight to safety, right, because the dollar was way up, but not just against the pound. And the pound really got pounded. It had its biggest down day in the history of the pound. It was down about 8%, 8.5%. But at one point last night, I, I saw it down better than 10%. And of course, the pound was pounded even harder relative to gold. Right. The price of gold in terms of British pounds rose above a thousand pounds per ounce last night when it was up about one hundred dollars an ounce. Briefly. Right. Gold went up one hundred dollars an ounce. It was over thirteen fifty. In fact, when it did that, I tweeted it out. And that, you know, that was pretty much the top because by the time I finished the tweet, it was already 20 bucks off that high. But I thought it was a significant thing that the the doubt that gold had managed to spike as high as one hundred dollars an ounce. So pound finished the day down about, what, 12 or 13 percent against gold because gold was up 5 percent. Gold was the strongest monetary asset of the day. 
But number two was the yen. And the yen, at one point I saw the yen up about 5% last night against the dollar, which meant it was up like 15% against the pound. Now, why is everybody buying the yen? Why are they buying the dollar? Now, people say, oh, it's a safe haven. Not really. I mean, does anybody think that the Japanese economy is some bastion of safety? I mean, come on. I mean, there's a lot of problems in the Japanese economy. And there's even more problems in the American economy. I mean, why would anybody worried about Europe buy the dollar? I mean, yes, the uh, UK is going to leave the Eurozone, but the America isn't even in the Eurozone. I mean, if it's so bad not to be in the Eurozone, why are you buying the dollar? And again, the Swiss franc, the Swiss government had to intervene. I mean, they didn't have to. I mean, they were dumb, but they did it. Uh, and the Swiss franc was down only about a percent or so against the US dollar today. Uh, it probably would have been up had the Swiss uh, central bank not intervened. But think about the irony of this. People are so worried about Britain leaving the Eurozone and that they're selling the Euro to buy the Swiss franc, which is a country that never even entered the, the Eurozone. So think about the irony there. But what is going on here? It's not about safety. It's about risk on and risk off. What is risk on? That is when you buy risky assets like stocks. doesn't matter. Any kind of stocks, right? You just buy stocks because they're going to go up. And how does the leveraged speculative community fund the risk on trade? They go to the funding currencies, the currencies where you can borrow real cheap. The most popular funding currency is the Japanese yen, right? Everybody wants to borrow in yen because, you know, they pay you to borrow in yen. So it's real cheap. You can lever up. And to a lesser extent, uh, the dollar is a funding currency. I mean, we've had very, very low interest rates in the U.S., especially when you look at it relative to our inflation rate. So there are a lot of people that borrow yen, borrow dollars, and lever up. They buy all kinds of stocks right, all over the world. That's what everybody was doing going into the Brexit vote because everybody was looking to ride the remain uh, to uh, new highs in the risky assets. And so the minute everybody was shocked by the results, people had to reverse the risk on trade and they had to put on the risk off trade. Well, how do you take off risk? Well, you sell the stuff you bought, right? And you buy back what you sold. So you sell the stocks that you bought and you buy back the yen or the dollars that you shorted. And that's what happened. That's why you had these big spikes in these currencies. It's not that people are saying, oh, Japan is such a safe country. I want to be in the yen. They're not even thinking. They're just acting. It's just a reflex. The same thing with the dollar. There is no safety in the U.S. dollar, but people are buying it anyway. But the only asset that is actual safety was gold because nobody is funding their risk on trades by shorting gold. At least I don't think they are. I mean, that'd be a pretty dumb way to do it. Um, but everybody bought gold because gold went up in every single currency on the planet. But a better way to look at it is not that gold went up. It's that every fiat currency went down. It's just that some went down more than others. So the fiat currency that lost the least value was the yen. And then after the yen, the dollar. And then after the dollar, maybe the Swiss franc. And then, oh, but the Canadian dollar didn't do that bad. Uh, but it was still down, I think, over a percent, percent and a half. But the point is, gold didn't go up. Everything else went down. And I think this is, again, a breakout in the price of gold. We did close up about 60 bucks. So we never regained... Uh, the $100 up level that we achieved, uh, you know, right after it was obvious uh, that uh, Remain was going to lose and that Leave was going to win. But we closed above 1315. This was where all the resistance has been in gold. Every time we got above 1300, uh, we got clobbered. We never closed above it until today. And I think this is a good breakout in the price of gold. And I think we're going to see a lot more upside uh, in the days and weeks ahead. In fact, even Goldman Sachs, I think uh, Curry was out there who had been very, very bearish on gold all the way up, is now uh, getting bullish. I don't think that that's necessarily a contrarian indicator because it's not like everybody is bullish. And he's not wildly bullish. He's just kind of mildly bullish. And a lot of the reasons for the bullishness is the uncertainty surrounding the Brexit. This has got nothing to do with it. You know, a lot of people think the reason that gold is up is because of Brexit. I mean, that was the catalyst for the rally uh, today, but it, it was going up anyway. In fact, the reason gold sold off over the past a couple of weeks is because people were pretty sure that Brexit wasn't going to happen. And so people started selling gold because everybody thought, well, you know, 
Brexit is good for gold, and since it's not going to happen, that's going to be bad for gold. I always said it was noise. I think even if they had voted remain, I believe gold would have got up. So I don't think it mattered. But this is an easy excuse for the people who don't understand why gold is going up. They can just chalk it up to the uncertainty and not look at all the things that we're actually certain of in the U.S. economy and with the Fed and the dollar that are the real driving force behind gold. And in fact, you didn't get a lot of uh, people jumping on board because if you look at the gold stocks, the GDX was up about 6% today on a 5% move up in the price of gold. I mean, normally you get a 5% move up in the price of gold. You'd probably get a 10 or 15% move in the price of gold stocks. I mean, not normally because you don't normally get a 5% up move in the price of gold in one day. This is one of the biggest up days in the history of gold, percentage-wise, but not really for gold stocks. We'd have plenty, we've had plenty of days this year where gold stocks were up more than they were today, even though the price of gold wasn't up as much. So I still don't see a widespread uh, embrace of the gold trade uh, by the Wall Street crowd. So I think this is going to continue. In fact, I mentioned on an earlier podcast the big difference between gold and the financials because the financials are getting decimated. I mean, some of these banks, uh, Barclays was down better than 20%, the British bank, but you had uh, Credit Suisse, I think, was down 15%, a Deutsche Bank down 16%. These are all new multi-year lows. I don't even know how long it's been. These are way below the Lehman lows of 2008. So as the financials are getting crushed, the antithesis of the financials, gold, is going higher and higher. And I think this trend is going to continue and I have no idea how long it's going to be before Wall Street kind of jumps onto this trade. But so far, the fact that so few uh, on Wall Street are buying into it, I think is a good thing because we continue to climb this wall of worry. And the, the, the less baggage we have, uh, the more I like it. And in fact, there was even more economic news that came out today that was ignored. Because obviously the Brexit headlines trumped everything. Uh, but we got durable goods orders that came out for May, and they were bad. I mean, they were they're pretty bad. Actually, they were pretty horrible. Uh, they were looking for minus 0.7, and instead we got minus 2.2, about triple the decline they were looking for. And they even slightly revised last month's spike from 3.4 to 3.3, but the internals were even worse. In fact, core capital goods year over year down 3.6%. Um, they revised last month's decline to down 4.2 from 5, but still, that 17 consecutive year-over-year -year declines in core capital goods. I mean, 17 months in a row. This has never happened in the U.S. economy unless the U.S. economy was in a recession. And I still think it hasn't happened outside of a recession because I think we're in one. It's just that nobody wants to admit that we're in one. Even the consumer sentiment index that came out today came out worse than expected. Last month was 94.3. They were expecting a slight decline in 94. Instead, we got a drop down to 93.5. And I'm sure what's happened this month and what's happening in the markets is going to cause that number to go a lot lower. Now, also today, the Atlanta Fed, which has this crazy uh, second quarter GDP estimate of 2.8. Right, they're up at, They went down to 2.6 as a result of, I'm not even sure, but they came down to 2.6. But to me, that still looks like it's awfully high for an estimate for second quarter GDP, given all that is going on in the second quarter. But I think the person who was likely to be the happiest today was Janet Yellen. I mean, as far as Janet Yellen is concerned, this is manna from heaven. I mean, this is just what the doctor ordered, right? Because Janet Yellen has been in a bit of a quandary because she's been talking about how great the economy is, but she hasn't been raising rates. Yet she's been saying that higher rates are appropriate given the recovery, yet she won't raise rates. Why? Well, because I think she knows that there is no recovery. It's just a bubble. And she doesn't want to put any more holes in it by raising rates again. I mean, she tried that once and it was a disaster. And maybe that's the one time the Fed has actually learned from its mistakes. Again, not that it was a mistake to raise rates. The mistake was thinking you can get away with it, which the Fed uh, couldn't do. So obviously they don't want to do it again, but they don't want to admit that. So they keep talking about how the economy is recovering and we're on this road to recovery and there's a rate hike around the next corner. We just don't know where that corner is or how long it is, but don't worry, we're coming there and we're going to raise it. But now, now she's got an excuse, right? All hell's breaking loose now. The markets are tanking. The dollar went up. 
Um, you know, there's all this uncertainty now. Is Britain headed for recession? What about Europe? Is that going to spill over into the U.S.? They can talk about, oh, this strong dollar. Not that it's going to last very long, but they'll say, oh, you know, this is going to mean there's not going to be a lot of inflation. You know, ironically, you know, one of the things I keep hearing people talk about on, on the news today was how Britain is going to benefit from this big drop in the British pound. Like, hey, they got lucky here. See, the pound got clobbered. This is going to help the economy. It's not going to help their economy. It's going to hurt the economy. The reason the pound got pounded is because people believe that Brexit is so bad for the UK. Now, I don't think it is. I think it's good for the UK. But a lot of it depends on what the UK does. See, if this really is a repudiation of big government, of excess regulation and, and bureaucrats meddling and micromanaging, then it's good for Britain. But they have to bring it home, right? It's not to, hey, let's get out from under the tyranny of Brussels. They don't want to re replace it with their own tyranny, homegrown style, uh, you know, out of London. What they've got to do is they've got to take that limited government, less regulation, more freedom. They got to take that to heart and incorporate those changes internally. See, a lot of people were using Switzerland as an example of how successful you can be outside the EU. Yes. But you got to emulate Switzerland in other ways. You got to, you know, take apart the welfare state and have, you know, smaller government, have lower taxes. And the British can have all that if they're smart enough to vote for it. And in which case, the pound is a great buy relative to other fiat currencies. But the fact that the pound is down is not a relief. It's not going to make things better in, in Britain. It's never better when your citizens are poor. It's never better when your cost of living goes up. That's the nonsense that passes for genuine economics. That's the the stuff that they were trying to shovel down the throats of the British to get them to uh, remain in the EU. But bringing it back here to, uh, to Janet Yellen. So now she's got this perfect excuse, a perfect scapegoat, why she doesn't have to raise rates. See, it's not because of the U.S. economy. See, the U.S. economy was great. And, you know, we were getting ready to raise rates. We were just about to do it. And then all of a sudden, this Brexit thing happened. And, well, you know, now we can't do what we were going to do. Yeah, we've got a really strong economy. But, you know, now there's some uncertainty out there. We've got to be careful about some of this stuff spilling over from Europe and infecting our otherwise healthy economy. You know, maybe this, th th this is kind of like a little virus. It's like a flu. And we want to make sure we don't catch it. You know, kind of like the Zika virus. And uh, so we just, need, we just need to be a little bit careful here. And in fact, maybe we need to inoculate ourselves against this disease. And you know what that means? They got to cut rates back down to zero, right? Maybe we have to do QE4, not because the U.S. economy is, is sick, but because the rest of the world or Europe is so unhealthy that we just need to inoculate ourselves to make sure we don't catch that, right? Because our economy is in good shape, but we just need a booster shot of this stimulus. And don't worry, you know, at some point in the future, well, you know, we'll, we'll turn it off. We'll, we'll raise rates back up. Uh, we'll shrink the balance sheet. We're just going to have to do it a little later than we thought. See, this is perfect. And even if they have to do this before the election, well, you know, it doesn't make Obama look bad. And by extension, it doesn't make uh, his heir apparent, Hillary Clinton, look bad because if the Fed has to ease because of problems in Europe, hey, it's not our fault. Hey, after all, Obama went to Europe and he warned the Brits not to vote for Brexit and they did it anyway. And so, you know, it's not his fault. And of course, we, you know, the Fed has just got to do what a central bank has got to do. It's got to, you know, pr provide liquidity. You know, also I was watching on CNBC and Alan Greenspan was being interviewed and they asked him about this. And he was like, this is the worst crisis I've ever seen in, in his career. I mean, what is he talking about? And then he said, you know, this is even worse than the 1987 stock market crash when the Dow was down, you know, 20 percent in one day. I mean, what, and was it, what was it down? Three, four percent today? I mean, that was down 610 points. How is this worse than the 87 crash? What is, what is this guy talking about? And how is it worse than the financial crisis in 2008 when the U.S. economy was imploding? Where is this guy coming off saying this is the worst thing he's ever seen? I mean, maybe because he's not the Fed chairman. He wants to make it look like, look, you know, this is way worse than anything that happened on my watch. Although I would still, you know, saddle him for what happened on Bernanke's watch, because he's the guy that lit that fire. Sure, Bernanke, uh, you know, didn't put it out. He, he made it bigger. But Alan Greenspan is the guy that got it started. But, you know, then he started talking about entitlements. And, you know, it's just, the problem is entitlements. You know, he's been saying that since the beginning. You know, if you look, I finally found the uh, emails that Alan Greenspan sent to me back in 1987. 
I emailed him, not, not emails, letters. We didn't even have email back in 87. What am I talking about? So, you know, when I got out of college and we had the financial crisis and the stock market crash, and I saw what Greenspan was doing, right, in response, I knew he was doing the wrong thing. How did I know? Because I read what Greenspan had criticized the Fed for doing in 1929. And I said, guys, he's doing the exact same thing. Why is he doing exactly what he said you're not supposed to do? So I called him out on it and I sent him a letter. And he replied, he sent me a letter. And then I followed up with another letter and he sent me a second letter. And I put those two letters on the internet. You can see it on, my, on the Shift Radio website, shiftradio.com. Check out the letters he wrote me. But back then, what did he say? Congress just needs to get the budget under control. We need to get entitlement spending under control. Well, he's still singing that song. I mean, what is this, 30 years later? I mean, does he, doesn't he know by now that that's not going to happen? And, you know, then he said, well, we just need to slow down the growth of entitlements. It's not about slowing down the growth. They're already too big. How can they grow? I mean, the, we've got to get rid of these so-called entitlements, but we can't do it. So all we're going to do is keep on growing the debt until we have a crisis. And maybe Greenspan knows that there is a big crisis coming. And what happened in, with the Brexit is the wake-up call. See, what he's really worried about is not what happened on that side of the Atlantic, but what this guy knows is going to happen on this side of the Atlantic. Because this is the real problem. We, we don't have to worry about what's going on in Europe. We need to worry about what's going to go on over here. And, you know, from a political perspective, the fact that the Europeans voted, right, to leave, right, this raises the odds that they're going to vote for something similar in the U.S. And what's similar to that is Donald Trump, right? It's not Hillary Clinton. Voting for Hillary Clinton is like voting remain. It's like the status quo. I, I'm happy. I don't want anything to change. Well, you know, why would you be happy with this disaster? And if the only change that you can vote for is Donald Trump, well, then that's what you're going to do. Even if you don't like him, you'll hold your nose and vote for him anyway. Now, it was interesting. I looked at a poll that on the Sanders voters, apparently almost half of the Sanders voters uh, aren't going to vote for Clinton. And about maybe 20% of them said they would vote for um, for Trump. And I was surprised about 17% said they would vote for Gary Johnson, the Libertarian camp. I'm surprised they even know who Gary Johnson is. Maybe he was just on the poll and they saw the name and they said, yeah, I'll vote for him because he's not Hillary and he's not Trump. Uh, but so this probably raises the odds of that. But we are coming to our own crisis, our own version of Brexit. You know, and it's unfortunate, too, that we don't have on the ballot, you know, in all the states to, to, you know, to get out of uh, the United States. I mean, why can't we do a Texan, right, which would be Texas voting its way out uh, or, you know, any, 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 any country. I mean, a lot of these countries that don't have their own income tax and are net taxpayers to uh, the U.S. government would like to vote to get out from, you know, this union. I mean, you talk about all the bureaucrats and all the regulations coming out of the EU. Well, we've got it in spades coming out of D.C. That's our EU, right? That's our bastion of bureaucrats. I mean, a lot of these guys, these guys aren't elected. A lot of these guys are just appointed uh, bureaucrats that are just, you know, micromanaging us and ruling over us as they live in their, you know, little ivory fishbowl of Washington, D.C. You know, if you didn't see that video, I put it up on my uh, Facebook page, Brexit the Movie. I really recommend checking that out. It really does a good job of showing you the culture that they've created over there in Brussels with all these bureaucrats. And, you know, this is kind of one of the reasons, too, you have so many people in poverty and you just oppose that to these guys living high on the hog, uh, you know, in, in, in Brussels working for the EU. Well, ordinary Britons are, are barely, you know, putting food on the table. You know, this is what's going on. And they're asking people to get by with these little trinkets of freebies that they that they give you, kind of Roman style bread and circus. Hey, just you know, be satisfied with this and don't care about what you know us Romans are doing here in in, in the palace. You know, just be be happy that you're getting you know your free stuff. Uh, and well, eventually they throw that free stuff right back at you. And I think that's what's coming on. We've got our own political revolution coming in the United States. I have no idea what's lurking on the other side of it. Just like we really don't know for sure. What's on the other side of this Brexit? Are the British going to vote to make themselves the next Switzerland? Or are they going to vote to make themselves the next Greece? I don't know, right? But, you know, if you look at that or watch that movie on, you know, Brexit the movie, they do a good job of comparing what happened in the UK after the Second World War and what happened in Germany. Because Britain won the war, but they lo their people lost. Germany lost the war, but their people won. Because when... Uh, Germany was dismantled, so was their government. Right? And so they rose from the ashes of defeat with free market capitalism. 
the British government survived the war, unfortunately for the British, and it got bigger and bigger, and they got even more control and more regulation and more taxes. And so within a short period of time after the war was over, they were actually rationing consumer goods in Great Britain, and they had massive abundance in Germany. And so while uh, the UK was riddled with inflation, the Germans benefited from deflation. Yes, they had inflation after the First World War, but after the Second World War, when they had a freer market approach, they had deflation. They had falling prices. They had abundance. They had all the consumer goods they wanted. They created, it was called the German miracle. There was nothing miraculous about it. It was just freedom. It was just capitalism. You know, the, 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 the crazy thing is the countries that lost the war, look at Japan until they screwed themselves up with Keynesian economics uh, in, after the 1980s. But the, the other country that, that lost the war, uh, Japan. I mean, Japan just rose like a phoenix from the ashes. I mean, we had bombs. Japan was a wasteland. I mean, yes, there were bombs that, that, that landed on in, in Britain, uh, but Britain was in great shape compared to uh, Japan and Germany. And yes, you know, we, Japan and Germany got money from the United States in the Marshall Plan, but we gave more money to Britain. Britain got more money than Germany or Japan. The problem was uh, Britain's government was intact and in Japan and Germany, the governments were in ruins. And they started from scratch and they followed a free market uh, plan and that's why they became so successful. So there is a blueprint that works that the British can follow. In fact, Britain ruled Hong Kong for a long time. And look what a success Hong Kong was. I mean, Britain was a basket case for all the years that Hong Kong was booming. Why? Because they left Hong Kong alone. They didn't subject Hong Kong to all the crazy regulations and taxes that they inflicted on their own people. So hopefully they'll make the right choices. But again, in the United States, I don't know what's on the other side of this uh, revolution that's coming or this political evolution, but it's coming. And we're about to hit a brick wall when it comes to deficits and entitlements and the Federal Reserve. And that is going to make what's happening over there uh, in Britain right, look like that proverbial Sunday school picnic. And that's what I think Alan Greenspan is talking about. He can't possibly be talking about what just happened last night as the worst thing he's ever seen. He must know that this is the first domino, and there's a lot of dominoes coming down that really have nothing to do with Brexit, but this is just basically the tipping point. And now a lot of things are gonna happen that people didn't expect, and a lot of those things are gonna happen in the United States. And I believe that Alan Greenspan knows this because for all the mistakes he made and all the stuff he got wrong, in his heart, he's still an Austrian. He still believes in the gold standard. I mean, you don't get as smart as Alan Greenspan was. And you read some of his early writings. He was a smart guy. You know, when he was hanging around with Ayn Rand, I mean, you know, he, wa he wasn't a fool like some of these other central bankers, like Yellen or Ben Bernanke. This guy knows his stuff. And for whatever reason, he went over to the dark side, you know, kind of like Darth Vader. But, you know, he has one foot, you know, on the good side, you know. And so he understands this. And so he knows that something really bad is in store for us because he understands the mistakes that he made. He understands the mistakes that Bernanke made and he understands the, make, the mistakes that Yellen is making. He just doesn't want to admit it because then he has to, he has to basically you know, condemn himself. He has to fess up to his own sins. He doesn't want to do that, uh, at least publicly. But you read between the lines and the fact that he sees, he sees this disaster coming. He knows. He knows it goes much, much deeper than what's going on in Britain. And, and he knows it because he was in the thick of it, at the heart of it. And now he wants to create a little bit of a distance from himself. He wants to be able to say, oh, well, I warned you about it like I saw it coming. He doesn't want to you know, be as blind as he was before when he said, oh, there's no tech bubble or you never know a bubble until after it pops. Right? He wants to have a little bit of vindication. It would just be nice if he fessed up. Maybe, who knows, maybe, maybe before he dies, he'll have a guilty conscience and he'll want to do something, you know, good for a change and just acknowledge, you know, just kind of, you know, just take one for the free market team and just kind of confess your sins, right? Just admit all the mistakes that you made. So maybe, maybe we won't make them again in the future. Today's financial advisors behave like pro wrestling TV commentators. They scream that the recovery is strong, debt is manageable, inflation is low, and that the Federal Reserve has everything under control. They may be oblivious, but the danger is real. 
Looking beyond the media hype can open a world of broader investing ideas. Euro-Pacific Capital is a registered investment advisor that offers stock-focused wealth management services that closely follow the strategy of our founder and CEO, Peter Schiff. We concentrate on those countries that are more closely in tune with Peter's vision of how capitalism is supposed to work. And these investments are not hard to find, provided you know where to look. Isn't it time you change the channel and let Euro-Pacific put a little reality back into your portfolio? If you live in the United States and have $25,000 or more to invest, call 800-727-7922. That's 800-727-7922. Non-U.S. residents access similar strategies through Euro-Pacific Bank at europacbank.com. Euro-Pacific Capital and Euro-Pacific Bank are affiliated companies.